So I've titled this uh, Letters to the Editor, because <laughs> that's what it's about. <laughs> The only thing is, when you read letters to the editor, what are they? Well, there's someone's opinion, all right? This is not Jeremiah's opinion. This is Jeremiah's, this is the word of God that God gives Jeremiah to write to different people's groups. So in this chapter 29, you get several different letters that are involved in this chapter. You have a letter from Jeremiah to the exiles that are in Babylon at this time. Then you have a letter that's uh, where uh, a letter that concerned the Jewish prophets, the false prophets in Babylon, that Jeremiah responds to and replies to. Then you have a letter from Shemaiah uh, to the temple priest concerning Jeremiah, because he doesn't like Jeremiah. Then you have a letter from Jeremiah to the exiles concerning Shemaiah. There's this guy, and we're going to find out who he is and what he's all about. But it's kind of cool because in Jeremiah's day, it was actually easier to write letters and correspond with people in Babylon. Uh, there were actually regular diplomatic missions that went between Jerusalem and Babylon monthly so that um, there were people that were writing from Jerusalem who had family who was captive in Babylon, and they were able to send letters back and forth. Jeremiah got a couple of these letters and heard about them and began to write himself. And that's really what um, this, this chapter is about. So the first thing he does is he's going to write words of encouragement to the people who are in Babylon. In verses, I'm going to read 1 through 14 and then we'll kind of walk through it. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother and the court officials, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying this, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives, become fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not increase. Verse 7, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good words to you and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations where I... From all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. These are great words of encouragement that Jeremiah shares. But what stands out to you in this? I think the first thing that I see in verse 4, I sent you. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar had nothing to do with it except follow the Lord's leading. And what has Jeremiah been saying the whole time? The whole time. Right? And then he repeats it again down in 14. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about him. Amen. It's all Amen. About him. And that's no different than the lives we live today. Right. And yet as Christians today, we get caught up 
in the calamities. We get caught up in the afflictions. We get caught up. We get anxious with what's in front of us. We fret when we're told to not fret. And, and what does it become? What does our Christian life become in today's day and age? All about who? All about us. And the whole time our Lord is saying, it's not about you. I know where I'm going with your life. Let me do it. And isn't that one of the hardest things to do? Yeah. To really let go? How many times has God's, God used, probably within our fellowship alone, somebody within our fellowship who had no idea they were poking your button? Yeah, right? How many times you get a poke in the button and you're like, oh, that person's poking my button. Like, how do you know that's not the Lord saying, I'm trying to show you where I've been trying to get you to change for the last 20 years. And this is the finger I'm using, right? And it, it, yeah, and God's like, it's me, it's me. How many times have we been in prayer meetings, we're rebuking Satan, you know? I rebuke the enemy as he pommels us, and God's like, it's me. I'm trying to show you something. Uh, many different times. George, I don't know how to your hand up. You're probably just stretching. Uh, yeah, praise the Lord for that. <laughs> Anything else that stands out to you in this? Yeah, I, th I think it's very obvious that he's telling them, look, you're going into captivity, but I don't want you to act like captives. Yeah. I want you to carry on with your lives. I want you to prosper. Yeah. I want you to prosper the land that you're living in. It, it, it's like he's telling us what he tells us. Or he's telling them what he tells us yeah. every day in our walk. So yep. Amen to that. Do that unto me. Yeah. Mark? Once again, he's shown his love and mercy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and hope. And hope. Very important because when you, like sometime after the deportation of, of the exiles into Babylon, which was like 597 B.C., Jeremiah sent them a letter telling them how to behave in the land. And, and this is probably part of it. So it just, one thing, it shows me the heart of a true shepherd because he cares about those who have even gone into captivity. And then he writes to enlighten them and encourage them to adjust to the society that they're now living in and to stay away from idolatry. That's what he's trying to show them. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the Lord, when Jerusalem had turned their backs on God, and the Lord says, oh, how I long to put you under my wing like a mother hen. Yeah. Well, now they're there, and what the peop most of the people in exile had lost hope because they're in exile. So you're going to read about them. They're down by the rivers of Babylon crying about the praise songs they used to sing to God in Jerusalem. Now, they weren't singing to him with all their heart. They were just repeating the words that the worship team was singing kind of type thing, and it wasn't from the heart. But now they're in captivity, and they're in a dark place in their soul, and they see what they've lost. And they're down by the rivers weeping. Oh, just to go back and praise you with my brothers and sisters in the congregation and to sing. So there are many that have no hope. So Jeremiah, when he pens this, he's writing to three types of people who were found in Babylon, three types of Jews. Number one, those with no hope. Number two, those who have a false hope. And then number three, those who have the true hope of God in their heart that know exactly where God's going. Look at verse 4. David touched on that. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. So, so these exiles had lost everything to be taken into captivity into Babylon. Understand this. You're in Jerusalem. You're taken into captivity by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, and, and it's done this way. Hands tied behind your back, clothing stripped off your body. Nobody has anything on, and they take a big brass hook, and they stick it up in your nose and around and pull it, and it goes to a string, and that's tied to the back of a, of a private in the Assyrian platoon. And if he wants you to go, he just tugs like this, and you go wherever he pulls you. They didn't go into Babylon happily praising God. They went into Babylon absolutely defiled and full of shame. So when they got to Babylon, they had lost everything. Many that came with nothing. Uh, so when they got there, many were disfigured, scarred from being pulled by the nose to Babylon. 
They had lost their freedom. They're now captives. They had lost their homes. They lost their way of making a living. They were separated from family, from friends, and some, from, some perished along the way. It was such a long march from Jerusalem to Babylon. Uh, I mean, the situation looked hopeless, right? And he says to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, build houses and live in them. You know, get out of the, the river and stop crying. Stop whining about what you lost. Know that God sent you there. Know that God's going to bring you back from it. Know that God providentially is fully and completely in control of your lives, and he wants to bless you, and he's not going to bless you if you go down to the river and whine. He's saying, get up, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, become the fathers of sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and your daughters to your husbands, and that they may bear sons and multiply, and there do not increase. You know, um, amazingly, how do you handle a depressing situation? How do you face it? We all face it in a different way, right? The best thing that we can possibly do as followers of Jesus Christ is accept it from the hand of God and let God have his way in it. Those are great words, except when I'm facing a desperate situation. And yet God is saying, this is it, right? It, doesn't, it does no good to sit and weep about it. The first step in turning tragedy into triumph is to accept the situation courageously and put yourself into the hands of the living God, the loving God who makes no mistakes with your life. So the first people, he's saying, you don't have any hope? Let me give you hope. You want hope? Put your hands, your life into the hands of the living God who cares about you. Guess what God understands? If we were to take every tragic or afflicting conflict or circumstance in every one of our lives today. We could write a book about it, couldn't we? So we could write 10 books about it. And yet our Father in heaven, who has promised us that we are his children by the blood of his Son, knows exactly where he's going with that circumstance, knows exactly why that affliction has come upon you, knows exactly where he's going with it with you. And we say, I surrender to you in this, have your way, Lord. And then sometimes we get up and we try to handle it ourselves. And, and he's showing them, you want to see the living hope of who God is to you? Accept it as the hand of God and let him handle it and walk this out and then to those with a false hope um, he, he he's bold about it look at verse 7 seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will have welfare these are people there that have listened to the false prophets that were there and they have a false hope see the false prophets had convinced the people that that stay in Babylon uh, that, that, that were taken in exile, you're only going to be there a couple of years. What did we read last week? Yeah. You're only going to be there a couple of years. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar is about to fall. His kingdom is going to be destroyed. God's going to bring everything back and all the exiles back within the next two years. And then we're going to put Jehoiachin right back in that throne again. You have nothing to fear. So people have come there. Some have come there. They've lost all hope. Some have come there. They have a false hope. Well, I'm not going to go get a job because we're out of here in two years. Why do you think God will not tell us the time of the rapture of the church? Why do you think? Well, what would the first thing we do? Quit our jobs? Yep. Well, he's coming home in 30 days, baby. I'm done with that place, man. See ya. And yet that's the place where God called you to share his gospel. Mark? Yeah. They were taken into captivity. He said, you're going to be there 70 years. They were there 70 years. You've got these other prophets saying, oh, you're only going to be there two years. They still believed them, even though what Jeremiah said was true when they were taken captive. And they went to captive. <laughs> like, maybe we should start listening to him. At least that's what I was saying. Yep. <clears throat> well. <laughs> they didn't listen to him before. Why didn't they listen to him? 
now. That's right. You know? Yep. They, they listen. So he writes to them and says, rebuild this, seek the city, yeah. take wives, uh, get wives for your sons and husbands for your daughters. And he's telling them, do this. And they're going, I'm not going to do that. We're out of here in two years. Like, I'm going to go follow Jeremiah. First of all, you know, like Mark said, they should have, uh, should have thought about, well, I am in captivity. Uh, he did say that, you know, and uh, it, it would, but they don't even think about it. Um, I don't think they're very smart. No, <laughs> they're not very smart. And by this time, it's, it's way past two years. That's right. Look at verse 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. You know, God's saying, listen, you're going to be there 70 years. You're going to have plenty of time to build houses and to set up homes. And because God knows what he's doing, he knows that if they don't do that and how important it is for them to have families so there'd be a people in 70 years who could be exiled back to Jerusalem. And if they don't do that and they don't raise a family, there's, there's no, going to be no one of that family name to go back. And he's pressing them in a strong way. Um, you know, the small Jewish remnant that was literally being held in the hands of the Lord for the future hope of a nation that would birth the Messiah. That's who's in exile. You think about when you were walking in the world, in the bondages of the world, and you came to the realization that you were in bondage to sin because God showed you that and showed you the need to trust his son. And, and then you do that. And all of a sudden now the spirit of God's alive in you. You see a, a future hope with him. You see something to live for now that you never had before. And, and the whole time while you were in exile, so to speak, in Babylon, lost in a system of bondage, God knew exactly what he was doing to bring you to a place to trust his son. How much more should, should there be an excitement in our hearts to say, I don't want to keep this quiet. Everybody understand the bondage of sin that you were in before you got saved? And, and then set free from that to what explain to others to, to with an exciting hope that god knows what he's doing oh you're having affliction now but god is here to take you out of that bondage he's here to release you from drug addiction from alcoholism he's there to release you from your own psychotic mind and to give you a free road a fresh start Every day of your life. Hey, when's God's mercy new? When is it new? Every morning. Every morning. Every morning. That's a promise from God. And we hold on to that. So these exiles were to be peacemakers in the land where God brought them, not troublemakers. Imagine. Imagine you go to your workplace and nobody's a Christian there. No one prays. Nobody loves the Lord. They all curse. They all swear. They all take the Lord's name in vain. And then, and then you get what? Sometimes you get stubborn and mad. And instead of becoming a peacemaker, you become a troublemaker. At the very place God sent you, to the mission field, God sent you to. Uh, that's the, the King James Version. It, it, in verse 7, it says, Seek the peace. That's, yeah. The city where they're at. You will have peace. Absolutely right. You know, we're in this valley, and we call it the valley vortex. It just takes young people, and it sucks the life out of them, and it destroys their lives. And yet we're here, and God's saying, pray for the peace of this place. Pray for the peace of this city, the place where I brought you. Because in its peace, you'll have peace. And in that, in that whole way, that's a very active work and, and, and walk that God has. You know, so these, these Jews that were taken captive, that have a false hope, they were to be good, godly Jews even in a pagan land. How do you be a good, godly person in a pagan land? We're doing it. We're doing it. 
every single day, every single day. And it's not an easy walk, is it? We desperately need the Lord and the leading of his Holy Spirit, and we desperately need each other to be honest, to be faithful, to press, to press on through that. Amen to that. And so he writes to them because if they were to indulge in the false hopes of these false prophets, they're going to miss out on all that God is planning to do with them. How many times have we seen people come in and out of our fellowship and they're so fixed on something else instead of the Lord? And God's brought them in here and he's exposed their heart and showed them the need to trust his son to be saved. And they do that, but they're still fixed on something else in their life and they don't get it, so they run off to find it somewhere else. And, and the sad thing is they're indulging in a false hope and they're going to miss out on all that God had prepared for them here in this place. I wonder how many people that have come in and out of here would, would right now be Sunday school teachers or or. Royal Ranger teachers on a Wednesday night or, or serving in ministry in, in some way, in one way or another, going into a prison, somebody, and sharing the gospel. And instead, the mind's fixed on a false hope and it takes off for, for a, a life that's a fantasy that's not going to happen and missing out on all that God has for them. So he speaks to those with no hope and he speaks to those who have a false hope. And then in verse 10, really through 14, he speaks to those who have a true hope. And this is really important. He says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you, to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. You know, this, this true Hope is based on the revealed word of God, not on the messages of false dreamers. And that's what makes it a living hope. When God says this to a people, and he's saying it to you and I tonight, I know the plans I have for you, thus says the Lord. Plans to give you what a future and a hope, not plans for a welfare, not for calamity. I have plans for you. Oh, Lord, but, you know, the world and its, and its issues and its problems, we just got through this whole COVID thing. Oh, you know, but I might die and I might die and I might. Guess what? You might do in the next three seconds. Well, I'm not going to be a fool. No one's saying that. God says to his people, I know the plans I have for you. They're not your plans. They're mine. I know where I'm going with your life and their plans for welfare, their plans for peace, not for calamity. Their plans to give you a future and a hope. And he wants to be settled in the people in Israel. That this hope is based upon the revealed word of God, not on dreaming false messengers. God gives his people here a gracious promise to deliver them, and he will keep that promise. We know the future for these people. What does God do? He keeps that promise, and he brings them through. Though they face trial and difficulty, many of them died in Babylon, and their children came back out of it, God said, it's a people I'm speaking to, and I will bring you through this. You know, it's God who makes his plans for his people, and his plans are good plans that ultimately bring a future hope and peace for them. So what need is there to be discouraged. There's none. And we all know that, right? And yet we're going to face, some of us are going to face discouragement on the way home. Someone's going to face it tomorrow morning. You know, you sit here tonight, you hear the word, you're like, pray, what a great word. Thank you, Lord. You give me such a hope. Then you're on the way home and you drive it and you pop on the news 
And they say, you're not going to believe the stock market crashed down to a negative zero. And you're like, oh, my life just caved in. Or something happens. You're like, my horse didn't come in. Or whatever the case is. We, we're all going to face it no matter what. We looked at it in Revelation, right? That it says your, your uh, judgments are true and righteous. Yeah. Your promises and your plans are true and righteous. Are true and righteous, yep. You know, God doesn't reveal his plans to the people. Right. And he's telling them, trust in me, worship me, and I'll bring you to the promised land, but you're going to have hope. And the hope is true and bad. In a heartbeat. Yep. Yep. And yet we still have that hope. But the hope, yeah, right. Don't hang on to the hope. That's it. We hold on to that with all our might. Yep. I believe those four verses right there, 10 through 14, are, are a revelation of his faithfulness for this generation today. A absolutely. Yeah. Yep. But not just that. He's like, when you call upon me, then, then you will call upon me. Yeah. Right? And that means you're going to call upon me like you've never, you've always called upon me religiously. It's all I've ever been to you. And I sent you into exile because of it and because of what you did to the land. But then, when you spend 70 years in the bondage of Babylon. And I'm telling you that while you're in that bondage, get married, have children, raise a family, build houses. Pray for the peace of that place. And then you'll have peace there. But guess what? I will bring you out. And when I do, you will then call upon me. And when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. That's what he's saying. In a strong, strong way. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And again, Ernie, you said it. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. So in every situation, in every single circumstance, God's people have the responsibility to seek him and pray and to ask him to fulfill his gracious promises. Maybe we... You're here today. You're facing an affliction. You're facing a trial. Heavy. You know, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. Here's a promise from God. I hold tomorrow. And I hold you. And here's my promise. Not to destroy you, but to, but to, to give you peace. And not just to give you peace because it's not about calamity, I'm going to give you a future hope. Who in, on the face of this earth would reject a future hope? Even an atheist, if, it, if that future hope was the living hope of God and it was revealed to him, he would turn to God in a second and grab hold of that future living hope because that's what moves every single heart. That's why we have insecurities. That's why we face difficulties. That's why we make dumb decisions. That's why we keep going back to the old nature because we're, we're trying to grab hold of hope. And like the Israelites, remember when they were going through the wilderness and they came to Moses and they said, you know, we're going to go back to Egypt. Who are you to lead us? I remember when we, we sat by the Nile River and we were eating leeks and onions and, and it, every, it was the good life. And then you go back to Exodus and you read about it. Nobody was eating leeks and onions by the Nile. There was no change lounge, Sarah. And I'm just like munching on a leek and munching on an onion. They were in bitter bondage in heavy labor. They were eating bread and water. There wasn't greens for them to eat. They were in the bondage of, of wickedness. But yet in their brain, they thought it was so much better back then facing what I'm facing now. And Fred, you brought it up earlier. And yet, where was God taking them? To the promised land. To the land he promised them. And the only reason why they spent 40 years in the wilderness, why? Because they were so happy to follow God's lead? No, it's because they grumbled and mumbled and rebelled against them. <laughs> George?
Yeah. And I'm going to pray for that. Yes, this is the gospel, baby. <laughs> Amen. Yep. Start sharing with her. There you go. Like Ernie said, take her from like it was 11 to 14. Just walk through them verses, man. Because this is God saying, I will. I have a plan for you. Yeah. I think I share almost every week for probably the last 18 years that God has a plan for your life. That God's giving you direction. He's taking you somewhere. He has a purpose for your life. And sometimes people just, you hear it and you move on. You go right back to the old way of living in a, in a second. And God's saying it, it requires faith and it re does require responsibility to seek me, to trust me, to open up my word and, and, and lean upon what I'm showing you. And we take those steps, you know, they're, they're good. Fred? Are we predestined? No, we're not predestined. Because that predestination is about grace. That predestination, we looked at it on Sunday. The whole thing is that, is that God has predestined that a people will come into a relationship with him and be reconciled back to him by faith in his son. And any human being on earth that chooses to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior has found out that God has chosen that way for them to be saved. It's not that God chooses that. He just knows where he's going with your life. He knows why he's, he, you, you drew, he drew you to himself. He knows where he's going with your life. He knows where you're going with your life. And he goes out of his way sometimes in our lives to discipline us, to try to stop us dead in our tracks and say, I'm trying to redirect you here and I've been trying for a long time. And sometimes it's as simple as surrendering the heart. It's not so much it's a physical destination yeah. as it is. It's just, um, you know what? I, I say I trust you, and then I go right off and do things my way. And then I say I trust you, and I go right back and do it my way. You know, and, and it's like, I trust you, Lord. I believe. Well, trust, believe, faith is a confident assurance that God is going to accomplish something in my life. And I'm so confidently assured of that, I don't have to make my own plans. I can trust him when I face that hardship. And really, that's what Jeremiah is trying to show. So you look at verses 11 through 14, and you see that God's promises reach far beyond the Jews who were in captivity in Babylon. He's including all of Israel who be regathered once again after 70 years. So his promise is speaking 70 years down the road. And he's doing that. I guess you could, it's not predestined, but he's speaking the same truth to you and I right now, tonight. And yet that same truth to you and I, if we should live another 70 years, he's speaking that same truth where? Into our children, into their children's children, into that generation. He's speaking into it right now. And when I do this, and when I bring you through this, and though I've put you here, and then, and then I know where I'm going with your life, and then you will call upon me. Then, you know, when you're broken, when you're at that place, and I visit you, you're going to say, you, Lord, it's about you, and I cry out to you. Let me ask you this. Before you were saved, did you ever talk like that to God? That's right. We used his name as a curse. And yet we come to know this salvation and this grace and this mercy. And we can sit here and sing the songs that Pete led us in tonight and mean every word from our heart. Only a born-again people can do that. Only a people who God knows their future. I know where I'm going with you. We can lift up our hands and we can, we can praise and say, Shine, Jesus, shine. Shine in me. Shine through me. Whether I feel it or not, reach this land for your glory. Send me wherever you want me to go. Accomplish through me whatever you want to accomplish. I trust you. There's a tremendous hope here. But that's the hope. That's what Jeremiah shares with those who have hope. 
He doesn't share that with those that don't have hope. He shared, you know, go and build houses. Trust God. You haven't lost everything. You may have come to Babylon naked with a hook through your nose and disfigured, but while you're in Babylon, you, you get some clothes and you find a wife and you get married and you have children and you pass down the inheritance of who I am to you. And regardless of what they see or what they feel or what they think, you pass it down because I know where I'm going with your life and I know where I'm going with theirs. Where? To a future and a hope where they will call upon me. We got a bunch of little kids in that back room right now. And as little children, they, it was cool, I think it was on Sunday, last week or the week after, during praise and worship, I could hear the kids singing. Did you guys hear that? That was so awesome. They were singing with, oh, as loud as they could. They were praising God. And then they, then they were like, is, is it over yet? You know? <laughs> but that's, a, that's an innocent heart. When that heart faces the trials that this world is going to throw at it, and that heart continues no matter what it faces to trust its Lord, its Savior, he will bring that heart to a place where they will call upon him. And he will come and pray. They'll pray to him, and he will listen to them, and they will seek him with all their heart. When do you seek God with all your heart? Not when you're riding your Harley and everything's going great, and you're stopping at your coffee shop, and you're putting down a coffee, and you're eating an English muffin, and then you drive to the next one. You drive to, you're not seeking God with all your heart. When do you do that? When you're covered in despair and darkness. When you're covered in despair and darkness. When you're down by the rivers of Babylon and you've got nothing left of your life. I know many of you, I don't know that all of you have, but I know many that have been at rock bottom. And I mean rock bottom. Where there was no other place to go down except hell. And from that place, these loving, kind hands reached out to you and gave you life and said, okay, now learn to do things my way. Trust me. Stand up and walk and live and walk in this life and love me. And you watch what I do through you and who I reach through you. These are the people that have hope. That's you and I right now. That God's saying, you want to know why my hand is upon your life? Because I have a purpose for you. And that's in sharing my love with others. It's not about what you're going to make per week. It's not about where you think you're going in life. It's what I am doing through you and, th and those that I'm going to reach through you. How about your children? How many of us in this room think, think, well, my children have turned their back on the Lord. What do I do? What can I do, Lord? We're doing it right now. We're loving him. We're trusting his leading of his spirit. We're trusting his word. We lift them up to him in prayer and with an expectation that his promise stands to every single heart that said, come into my heart and save me. Wash my sins away. God never lets go ever of his children. And he has a way to bring them back to himself and he does that in a very powerful way. So these verses, 11 through 14, they speak so much ahead of, of the exiles that are just in Babylon. They're speaking to us tonight in a powerful way to bring us that living hope. And from there, you get to verse 15. And now Jeremiah is going to write, again, words of explanation. He's going to explain something that needs to be explained. Uh, let's look at it. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Um, as we go through it. 15, because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. For thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your brothers who did not go with you into exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I am sending upon them the sword, famine, and pestilence, I will make them like split open figs that cannot be eaten due to their rottenness. I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, with pestilence. I will make them a terror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse and a horror and a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. 
because they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, which I have sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. But you did not listen, declares the Lord. You therefore hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles, whom I have sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Koalah, and, and concerning Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, and those who prophesy to you falsely in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he will slay them before your eyes. Because of them, a curse will be used by all the exiles from Judah who are in Babylon, saying, May the Lord make you like Zedekiah, like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire, because they acted foolishly in Israel, and they have committed adultery with their neighbors and their wives, and have spoken words in my name falsely, which I did not command them. And I am he who knows and am witness, declares the Lord. Those are strong words. And yet he's given an explanation here. What do you, what's going on here? <clears throat> yeah. 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 With their own eyes. They're going to see it. Yep. Amen to that. You know, I was thinking as I was reading this, um, we read about in Revelation when Christ comes back, we read about all the death and destruction and, and, and the just punishment of those that continued to reject Christ and then to take on the mark of the Antichrist and to follow his identity. And, and that, was a, that was a painful chapter to read because that was, God doesn't play games with sin. He will devastate it and destroy it and we watch that happen and he's saying the same thing here like like it's a prophetic picture of of that last day what else you see in there you know so you have zedekiah who's still on the throne in jerusalem and these false prophets that were there were still giving the people false hopes concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and Jeremiah heard about it. And he writes it. So the false prophets, false hopes, this is what he writes, is no guarantee that your city is going to be delivered. You know, we're told in the last days, Jesus told us, when they're saying peace, safety around the whole world, peace, safety, peace. We all love one of the kumbaya. We're all, we're all one. We're all so one. Everything's positive. Peace, safety. Then the end shall come. And what a painful ending it will be. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, if you think these false prophets' hopes, false hopes are a guarantee that your city's going to be delivered, he says, you're going to be like split open figs. God said, I will split you open like rotten figs. And that's how it's going to be. And you're going to be thrown into a garbage heap, really, is the proclamation that he's saying. And I think that as we read these verses, um, you know, 15 through 23, the important thing here is not what was going to happen to the people who were still living in Judah, because Jeremiah is writing to the, eg to, to the exiles in Babylon. So the focal point is not what is going to happen to the people in Judah, but what are the exiles going to do in Babylon with the word God just gave them through Jeremiah? That's the whole focal point here. It's not what's, you know, we know what's going to happen to those that stay in Jerusalem. He says it. But the focal point is I'm writing to you in Babylon. What are you going to do with that word? That's what I do. I repeat, when we teach your word, we teach God's word. It's prepared. I sit here on a Sunday and I hand out God's word and I fully expect to God to fulfill his part in it and, and work into your hearts. And I fully expect you to receive it and do something about it. Sometimes people never do. Great sermon, Ron. Great teaching. Yeah. And, ne and, and there's never change. 
And, and God, he's saying the same thing. It, I'm writing to you about what's going to happen to the people in Judah and Jerusalem. But that's not the focal point. The focal point is you in exile. What are you going to do about what I just wrote? You're sending letters. Send letters to your family and say, surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, you have two years. You'll be back. Send him another one. Surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, I'm tired of getting your letters. Don't ever get tired of sharing the gospel with family members, with friends. Keep doing it. And let them squawk and moan and cry all they want. Don't come out of my house anymore if that's how you're going to talk. Okay, I'll send you a letter. You can rip it up if you want. But I'm going to keep sharing it with you. Because I'm going to be with my Lord one day. And I want you to be there. And I'm going to press on in that. And that's the picture. You know, will they obey? Will they build houses? Will they lead homes? Will they raise children? Will they pray for the peace of the city where they're at? Will you read the words and go, you're right. It's your word, Lord. This is not Jeremiah's opinion. It's the word of God. You're right, Lord. So toss aside my lack of hope and put on hope like we put on Christ. And let's go build a house. And let me start a family. And let me raise children in Babylon. And let me turn from worshiping idols and keep my eyes fixed on the living God while I'm in a distant city. Because God's promises in 70 years, so you start having children when they're 70 years old, I will take them back to Jerusalem. And though you may be dead and gone, I will take them. He's also warning the, uh, the false prophets that they're going to be accountable. Yeah. And if they're teaching something to the elders that, are, that is being proclaimed, that they will suffer the consequences. Absolutely. If they don't obey, and he's telling you, Right yep, yep, it is a warning. And these are the moral qualifications of the elders to preach the word. Yep, and he mentions two of them by name. Yeah. He's announcing doom to them. Yeah. That's yeah. scary, yeah. but it's very true. He's telling them, you, you don't do this. You know, if you keep doing this, you're not only preaching lies to God's people, yeah. but they're committing, a, they're living wicked lives. Mm -hmm. They're not just lying to the people. They're committing immorality before God and they're saying that they're from him you know you can't rebel against the word of God and win everybody get that can't be done you may think you're okay but in the end I think Pete you said that but in the end what what have you what is it to fall into the hands of the living God and hope to God his grace is real what a life and yet to us who, who understand surrender and trust in Christ, though we face calamity, though we face trial, though we face tribulation, what do we still retain? The joy of the Lord. We still have the peace of Christ. No matter how difficult my day has been, do you know the privilege it is for me to come in here with you guys and raise our hands and our, hands and our hearts and praise God together? Sometimes, right? Right? We face difficulties. We come in here, it's like, I'm going to praise God with all my might, man. I am so thankful to be with God's people in a place where we can praise Him like this. It's like an oasis. Absolutely. And we come together for that reason. So He does, So it is. Uh, but he's gonna, there's going to be an even greater word of warning. <laughs> he's going to get this guy Shemaiah uh, in that. <laughs> Look at verse 24. To Shemaiah, uh, the Nelamite, you shall speak, saying, now this is cool, because the Nelamite, there was no place called Nelam, right? <laughs> Nelamite means uh, a defiled dreamer, like the dreamer. So, he, he, so he's calling him the Nelamite. So, so what Jeremiah is saying here is, Shemaiah, the defiled dreamer, that's who he, that's who he is, Pete, <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah, Nihilo means zero. There was no place called Nihilo, right? But he says this defiled dreamer, and he says to Shemaiah directly, I'm speaking to you, man, you defiled dreamer. 
you shall speak, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have sent letters in your own name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, and the, and the priests, and to all the, the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada, and the priest to be uh, the overseen in the house of the Lord over every madman who prophesies. Now the madman is Jeremiah that he's talking about. So he's saying, he's calling Jeremiah that madman. He's saying, you're a Lord over the madman who prophesies to put him in stocks in an iron collar. Now then, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Ananoth who prophesies to you? For he has sent to us in Babylon saying, the exile will be long, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce. Uh, you know, he kind of, and Zephaniah the priest read this letter to Jeremiah the prophet. And then came the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, saying, Send to all the exiles, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah, the Nilamite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, although I did not send him, and he has made you trust a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to punish Shemaiah, the Nilamite, and his descendants. He will not have anyone living among this people. He will not see the good that I am about to do to my people, declares the Lord, because he has preached rebellion against the Lord. I mean, God's done this a few times strongly. How does, how does uh, 29 line up chronologically with 28? Because the end of 28, he talks directly to another guy. Yeah. And his end comes just as it was said. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. not that far away. Not that far away. No. But, far away that they didn't remember. Right. And God's, re it's recorded. Yeah. You know, that's frightening. And they remember, you're sitting, you're going to remember, Jeremiah the madman. <laughs> Every one of them. Uh, but that other guy in 28, he's dead too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe he hadn't died yet in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then he does die, and Shemaiah's like, oh, uh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but the thing is, this guy Shemaiah wrote letters to the exiles <laughs> in the name of the Lord. I wrote from exile to, to Jerusalem in the name of the Lord. That's a frightening thing. You think you got the authority to say, I say this by the name of the Lord. I mean, there's a lot of false teachers out there uh, on the internet, and they're, and they're using that all the time. A big time. That's insane. That's insane. And God's saying, you think you can toss my name like that flippantly and say, I said that? And then you call my prophet a madman? put him in stocks, in iron, put an iron collar around his neck. God's saying no. So, his, so this guy's urging the priest in Jerusalem to, to imprison Jeremiah because he's a madman. And yet Jeremiah writes to him, like, you got to just think. You know, don't, don't you think, like, just a little common sense, like maybe I shouldn't talk that way and use God's name falsely and then talk that way about Jeremiah because everybody else did die and they went into captivity and just to think. But no, they're, they're listen, listening to themselves. They're listening to the trusting their false prophets. And when he heard Jeremiah, he had to know that he, he, he was telling a lie. Yeah, absolutely. Not very smart. Nope. As the early prophetic warning of what the Pharisees and Sadducees said about you, Christ. Exactly, exactly. Yep. That's it. Yep. You know, it's really sad because this guy, Shemaiah, believed he, in two years he'd come back to Jerusalem. And he believed he'd see his sons and his daughters grow. And Jeremiah takes the spear of the Lord and sticks him in the heart with it and says, you will never see your sons and daughters grow and you will never come back to this land. You will die there. And he did. And that's a frightening thing. You know, last week I closed the service. I said it's a frightening thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's what these people are doing. And that means you've, you've spent your whole life believing you're okay. When the truth of God's word has been presented to you over and over and over and over and over, so much so you're sick and tired of hearing from this madman. And then you come down to the end and your heart stops beating and you find out wrong choice. You should have listened. What a place. You know, what life does to us depends largely on what life finds in us. 
And who dwells in us? That's by faith, right? Not by feeling. It's by faith. And so he's in us. And because he's in us, when, when, when life presses hard upon us, they should see him in us. Not a fight, not a kick, not a demand. Not, not even that stand, like I talked about on Sunday. When you study Thessalonians, you find out that the believers there weren't standing for Christ. They were standing for sexual purity in an immoral world because of Christ. Because of what he did for them. Because of the hope he put inside them. And, 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 the, and the world around them and their peers and friends hated them because of it. And that's where the persecution came from. You know, if we seek the Lord and really want his best, then the circumstances in our lives will prepare us for what he has planned. I think that's what he's teaching. He's trying to show, listen, if, if you really trust me and you want my best for your life, then understand that the circumstances of your life will prepare you for what I have planned for you. But if I rebel and all I want is a quick and easy shortcut, then the circumstances in my life will not only destroy me, they'll rob me from the future God wants me to enjoy. The same sun that hardens clay melts ice. What does life find in you? What have you found that life finds in you? Do the circumstances in your life, do you understand that they're actually there from God to build you and prepare you for what he has planned for you? And that we can handle them a whole lot different when we do. Go back to the verses 11 through 14 when you're facing heavy circumstances. Go back and read those again and say, Lord, you're going somewhere in my life. This is not the end. This wall that I've hit, this pressure that's dropped upon me, you're going somewhere with me, and I can trust you in that. And then those circumstances are used in my life to build me up and to prepare me. But to fight against it um, or to find an easy shortcut around it. How many have found that there are no shortcuts in life? And how many have found that there are no shortcuts in Christianity? I know a shortcut, you know? I can't tell you when I was a kid how many times... I, I've tried to find something, look up some book, find some kind of spell or some kind of pill that I could take so I could play piano like Pete. Just take a piano pill. Do they have no, if they had it, I'd believe me. I'd have bought, I'd, I'd have bought them for the last hundred years. It's not in my brain. It just doesn't work. Tried really hard. Took guitar lessons for, what, a year? My guitar teacher went to my dad and said, Please save your money. <laughs> it's not going to work. It doesn't work. Don't send them anymore. <laughs> no. There's a whole different thing. Yep. God knows. You know, in Psalm 139, verse 17 and 18, it's recorded, How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more than the sand. You know, God's thoughts and his plans towards us come from his heart, and they will always lead us to peace with him. So why look for substitutes? He's leading. And when you trust in his leading, he, he takes you all the way. And it is led to peace with Christ. And that's an amazing thing. And I'm going to close with, with 29.11. We go back up to verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Amen. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. And, and we're going to close with that because that's what God has for you. His plan is a future hope whether it's with him for eternity or whether it's next year on this earth serving him in some capacity, but it's pressing on in spite of the circumstances in front of us by faith in Christ and relying upon him. And you know what he does? He sees you through for it. And, and, and we are the better off as we press on in that together. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to walk through your word. 
And I pray, Lord, that this word that we receive tonight would be planted in our hearts and watered by your Holy Spirit, that your word planted deep would take root in our hearts, Lord, where the enemy would not be able to steal it away, that it would bear fruit for your glory and accomplish your purpose, Lord, for sending it forth. Have your way in our midst. Keep us united and strong as a fellowship of believers. Keep us secure on our faith in your Son. And bless the times that we gather to praise your name, Lord. Bless the times that we gather to walk through your word. Bless them for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.